minimal strain is 20 times. He is the first few times from the user. He is a direct current consultant. You are ended. You are ended six. He is a consultant, renal pathologist at, at Express Med Lab. He is a former consultant and emeritus consultant, histopathologist at Guy and St. Thomas Hospital, London. He is a former clinical senior lecturer at, at King College London Medical School. He is an examiner, FRC has. He is a tutor at East of England, generally FRC PAT histopathology course. He is also a former associate professor. So let's welcome Dr. Muhammad Nahim from the car. Thank you very much all for thank you for coming all the way for this presentation, this uh, course. Now you might think this uh, presentation is meant for trainees in histopathology and or consultants in histopathology. It actually is not. It is meant for both, both for histopathologists and also nephrologists and uh, renal medicine practitioners, consultants and trainees. And that is because there is a gulf, I think, between the two, between the pathologists and nephrologists. Uh, pathologists, us, that means, don't often know what the clinicians need. So our reports say things which they don't require to be, uh, you know, to be familiar with, and they omit the things which they want, they are looking for in the report. And similarly, the nephrologist should understand that the pathology report is only as good as the clinical information which is provided to them. See, a pathologist is lost if the clini clinical information is not complete, or it's lacking, or it's wrong and the report can be quite misleading as a result. So a renal biopsy report is therefore a mutual exercise. Both the pathologists and the clinical clinicians contribute to it. Uh, um, right. Uh, to begin with a brief summary of the various clinical syndromes seen in renal medicine, there is proteinuria, nephrotic syndrome, there is nephritic syndrome, acute renal failure, the predominant or gross hematuria, isolated maybe, or with one of the above. Um, right. And there can be, uh, it come with chronic renal failure or combinations of the above. Now, how do we report a renal biopsy? What's the diagnostic strategy we adopt? We begin with a full clinical history, 
and the results of tests. And common tests are done uh, that are autoimmune screen tests, including ANCA, anti-GBM, DNA, BSDNA, histological tests which are relevant to the diagnosis and virology screen. And of course, the description of the clinical syndrome that leads us to expected uh, possible pathological processes which can be expected in the biopsy so that our report is not far far off the right uh, far of the remark uh, far of the the course of the diagnosis the morphological diagnosis this is mainly for histopathologists it depends on routine stains commonly we do hne hematoxin using a good silver stain on a thin section maximum three micron thick a trichrome stain either mason or msb a pas and other stains which are as necessary, like Congo red, for example, or elastic stain. Immunohistochemistry, either immunofluorescence or immunoperoxidase, each one of them has its advantages and disadvantages. An electron microscope, if required, not in all cases. The, the incidence of uh, electron microscope in renal biopsy varies. Uh, guys used to do about 25 to 30 percent of biopsies of native kidneys used to we used to go for electron microscopy and uh, transplants very few but nowadays there's a trend to do all transplants in electron microscopy now what this pathologist is going to do is to identify the pathological process and then to identify its activity estimate the activity and chronicity very important to do that and then once he has done he or she has done that the pathologist then looks at the clinical pathological correlations and here it is important to discuss with phone or at multidisciplinary team meetings with renal physicians whether the course the pathologist is following diagnostic course is correct or not then you identify the disease entity for example focal is uh, segmented global uh, glomerular sclerosis and then you reach the final diagnosis or differential diagnosis if final is not possible come to actual process microscopy of, of the specimen the first step is to have an overview of this look at very low magnification how many cores are present usually there are two cores done from different poles of the case and what is included in the core in the back cortex cortex and medulla whether they are in continuity some pathological processes are in deep cortex only in deep cortex so unless you have them in continuity we might miss them and then you look at extensive lesions like microinfarcts or scars which affect large areas of the biopsy that gives you some diagnosis if there are other tissues present usually they are muscle skeletal muscle the, uh, the biopsy needle passes through the swatch muscle occasionally i've seen liver gut is not very uncommon but it rarely leads to any problems it rarely leads to leakage i've seen pancreas large blood vessels are a source of worry if you find a spleen then you must at once inform the renal physician the spleen is seen in left renal biopsy the normal spleen is a very small structure it doesn't come in the way of the core biopsy the spleen is seen it usually means it is a congested spleen, a large spleen, and that may bleed. So there's a real risk of bleeding, intra-abdominal bleeding, if the spleen is seen. Very uncommon, fortunately, in renal life. Now here is what we see. Now this is the core of renal tissue, cortex and medulla. Cortex is identified by presence of glomeruli and it's essential for most diagnosis. You must see cortex. Without cortex, you can't diagnose any condition. The majority of conditions cannot be diagnosed without cortex being present. If you have medulla only biopsies, all is not lost. There are some conditions can be diagnosed that can be diagnosed in medullary biopsies only, exclusive medullary biopsies, these are interstitial nephritis. Or light chain cast nephropathy of VK polyoma virus nephritis, especially in the setting of transplants. But the full diagnosis is not possible if the cortex is missing. 
Now you look at each of the four renal compartments, glomerular activules, interstitium, and blood. It's best to look at each compartment separately. So look at all the glomerular first, then look at tubules and interstitium, and then look at, and then you try to correlate. And you see examples of these. Now the best thing to uh, look at glomerular morphology is our PAS and silver. Good silver is essential and a PAS. So the HNE can may sometimes uh, be difficult to identify how many glomerular are To count the total number of glomerular. Why is it so? Because the ratio is important. Total number of glomerular and how many of them are normal, how many show the lesion. And also some classification diagnostic protocols, for example, lupus nephritis or IgA nephritis. And in many of the transplant biopsies, uh, minimum number of glomerular are essential. Or, um, you know, you should have at least a 20 glomeruli for lupus. Don't always get them. Uh, that's the ideal. Uh, for IgA, the recent um, Oxford classification says 10 glomeruli. Some conditions can be identified with lesser number of glomeruli. But if the glomerular number is low, then you cannot confidently exclude focal lesions, like FSGS cannot be excluded. If a patient of proteinuria comes, there are only six glomeruli, all of them look normal, if the tissue is uh, interstitial scarring, cannot exclude FSGS unless you cut through the whole block or uh, out of six glomeruli, no FSGS seen, and FSGS cannot be excluded. The total number of glomeruli is important. Then you calculate the ratio of normal to normal glomeruli. Then you decide what is a diffuse lesion and what's the focal lesion. I'll describe them, what, what we mean by diffuse focal. And what is the global lesion, what's the segmented lesion, how many of them are. And then describe all types of lesions, not only the sclerotic lesion, inflammatory lesion, patients, and so on. Now, what is a normal glomerular? A normal glomerular, seen here in a thin section, in with John Silver, has minimal mesangial matrix, capillary loops are of very thin, sort of monolayered appearance, and uh, there is no adhesion. This side, right hand side, almost normal. There is this equivocal increase in mesangial matrix, but there is an adhesion that can't be normal. Even a small adhesion rules out normality. It's important to know this because. Uh, conditions like minimal change disease, if you have small adhesion, cannot be diagnosed. Minimal change. You start looking for other causes. What about glomerular size? Many of the conditions, especially FSGS uh, or hypertensive disease of the kidney, they, they have enlarged glomerular, glomerular megaly. Now, to assess accurately the glomerular size to measure them, is possible, but you need enormous numbers of glomerulus, nearly 100. And the process is very complicated. It can't be done as a routine practice. One good hint is this one. To go to high drive, 400 times magnification. The diameter is about 440 nanometers. It should be nanometers. And if you see the glomerulus, which is best cut, sort of equatorial cut, largest diameter, the largest glomerulus in the biopsy. If it occupies more than half the diameter of the field, then it is enlarged. So it's the half of it will be 220 nanometer, uh, millimeter, uh, micron, sorry, micron, no, no. <laughs> I must take it back. It's microns, micrometers. So if it is more than 220 micrometers, then, uh, Um, then, oh. uh, it's frozen.
Bruno? I'm going. All right. You're in a crash course. Right. So there we are. Right. So, as I was saying, 440 micrometers is the diameter of the uh, 400 times magnification, the high drive objective. And if it is more than half of that, then it is more than 220 micrometers. That is an enlarged glomerulus. You need to be careful that you select the glomerulus which is the largest glomerulus and it is cut at the equator. Now, what is a diffuse lesion and what's a focal lesion? The diffuse glomerular lesion, if you see right hand side, is so many glomeruli there, eight glomeruli out of which six show lesions. So more than 50% of the glomerular are affected, then it's a diffuse lesion. If it is less than 50% of the glomerular, then here is only one affected or two affected. One. Therefore, it is a focal lesion. So it could be a focal glomerular lesion or a diffuse glomerular. That should come in your passage. Now, if you look at the individual glomerular lesion, then if it is more than 50% of the glomerular capillaries affected then a global one, sir, global lesion. Don't see many glomerular capillary lumina here. You see the rest are all obscured. Nearly what 80 to 90% of the glomerular capillary affected here. That's a global lesion. Pigmental lesion is seen here. Consolidation in the capillary surface. But it affects what? quarter of the glomerular capillary. So that is a segmental. Segmental and global are the terms used at individual glomerular level, whereas focal and diffuse are used at collective level, all the glomerular. So that's clear, difference between segmental and global, focal <coughs> and <coughs> diffuse. Now you look at the glomerular and look at each of these parameters. Is there any hypercellularity? Is there any increase in matrix or sclerosis? Are capillary lesions present? Or there is no change? Minimal. Minimal meaning this is small change in Right. These are the examples of glomerular hypercellular. You see, here, here you see the capillary lumina clearly. In this particular lobules, the lumen is not seen. That is endocapillary inside the capillary uh, hypercell, occluding the lumen completely. It used to be called consolidation. Sometimes it's still called consolidation. <clears throat> On that side, there is hypercellularity, but it's limited to mesangium only. All the capillary lumina are open. This one shows a combination. There is endocapillary hypercellularity. And there is also mesangial hypercellularity. Here, it is extracapillary. So urinary space, which is extracapillary space, is filled up with the cells here, which is also not. Whereas the glomerulus itself is shrunken, but it's otherwise okay. okay. There is no hypercellularity within the capillary or in the mesangium. So these are the various types of glomerular hypercellularity. Now, you can have increase in mesangian matrix, not cellularity, but matrix. Here, for example, there is segmental sclerosis, not, not global, it's segmental, small part, 50%. Again, here, segmental sclerosis. 
there is some sclerosis of the mesenchyme here only, but not complete occlusion of capillary. So there is that is segmental sclerosis. Very important lesion to diagnose because that constitutes what is known as focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis. You can have nodular glomerular sclerosis. Sclerosis in the mesenchyme, but it is nodular in shape. It's a global sclerosis. Almost all of the glomerular complete more than 50%. Sometimes uh, you get uh, specific types of sclerosis. In this case, uh, in, sorry, I should say, uh, in, in increase in mesangian matrix, in this case, amyloid being present. Now, next you look at the glomerular capillaries. Uh, if, whether they show thick and wall, and this thickening of wall constitutes, is, uh, is comprising of a single layered uh, glomerular basement membrane, or this is multi-layered. So there is spikes present or holes present. By holes, I mean when the GBM is cut obliquely, you see fenestration of holes within the GBM. There may be luminal occlusion by caused by cells or by thrombi, or there may be complete collapse or sclerosis of capillary. And these are the examples here you see a double contouring, sometimes known as tram tracking or railroading, to, uh, to almost parallel profiles of the GBM all over here. So these are double contours. Then you can have thickening of all duty spikes. By the way, this one also shows some vacillation where the GBM, thickened GBM is cut off legally, unfast and safe. This is, here it is cut perpendicularly, therefore you see. Uh, you can sometimes have link chain up here. So this, this can be. So this needs a very well done silver skin, thin section. So very early membranes, for example, this one, this case is, can be missed if the sections are not good. Or you can have complete collapse of glum, often associated with hyperplasia of podocytes. Or you can have luminal occlusions caused by thrombi, actual thrombi, sometimes in triangular range. So all these things, all these morphological features must be looked for and documented. Next, you look at tubules and interstitium. So the tubules you look at tubular epithelium cell. This is state any lesions from there. And lumina of the tubules, and if you see if the tubules are inflamed. Now this is the normal structure of tubular interstitium. The tubules you notice are back to back. There's hardly any interstitium seen, except around arteries, vessels, some. Uh, connected tissue, fibrous cuff around them. Otherwise, tubules normally are back to back. Again, uh, look at tubular epithelial cell. The normal cortex, you see proximal and distal tubules. And how do you differentiate? See these tubules, tubular epithelial cells, they have a brush border. The PAS is the best thing to look for brush border. Electron microscopically, these will be microvilli, right? If you see the number of cells there, there's one, two, four, five, six, twelve, but only four, maybe five nuclei are seen. That's because the cell cytoplasm has a huge volume, big cell, so that each section doesn't necessarily pass through. Uh, doesn't pass through the nucleus. So you see many cells, uh, but very few nuclear profiles. That is a sign of proximal tubule. Whereas, look at this tubule. The cells are small, and there are as many number of nuclei as the cells are. So this is a distal tubule. Important to recognize the difference between the two, because some conditions that affect the proximal tubules uh, can be easily identified then. You know what a proximal tubule? For example, here, acute tubular injury, the case of ethylene glycol poisoning. 
antifreeze and their proximal tubules not be recognized at all. Cells are big, but there's a huge big vacuole within yeah, within the cycle. Also, <clears throat> the tubules that are not affected are mostly distal tubules with acute injury. Um, then you have another example of acute tubular injury with vacuolation. This particular case was the cyclosporin A toxicity, isometric vacuoles. But you notice, unlike this proximal, normal proximal tubule, tubular diameters increase. Tubular uh, height of the tubular epithelium is reduced, flattened. You can still say this is proximal tubule because very few nuclei right, within each individual cell. Um, and here, okay. or you can have fusion, cytomegalovirus, right? Easy to pick up. Don't know why it keeps. <laughs> Is freezing. I don't know why. Is there something wrong with the? You go to next anyway. Meanwhile, can someone fix it? Go to tubular lumina, and in the lumina, some of this lumina show these red structures, which is a red cell cast, RBC cast. Now, RBC cast are very important to recognize. In some cases, you expect them, IgA nephropathy. You know, there is a definite glomerular lesion seen. But if there is no glomerular lesion seen and you see RGA uh, red blood cell cast, then you should look for glomerular lesion. Very important. That's a sign of a glomerular leak and it's from glomerulus. So in cases of, say, vasculitis, very, which is very focal, all the glomerula and the VAFC core may not show any lesion at all, but you see a lot of RBC cast before that is a hint to cut further deeper into the biopsy to look for a glomerular, focal glomerular lesion. Very important to recognize. Also remember, at the edge of the biopsy, you will find three red blood cells. They don't count. They are due to the surgical trauma of the biopsy itself. It's in the middle of the biopsy, and they have to be certainly fairly compact cores of red blood cells. But incidentally, there is also some acute tubular injury. The other type of car, and they're very similar cars, but not compact, with the brick red color, light red color, is myoglobin cars. Very easy to diagnose with a stain, myoglobin stain, and by a urine examination for, uh, you know, the spectro, spectroscopy for myoglobin. Um, but can be easily missed. The present with acute tubular injury, acute kidney injury, um, and uh, classically, they are seen in crush syndrome, right? that is car accidents with a lot of muscle injury, but they are not limited to crush injuries. They can be seen, I've seen them in status asthmatic, status epileptic, heroin poisoning, um, peripheral vascular disease with a lot of muscle injury, uh, and of course the uh, statin toxicity, all sorts of conditions, not necessarily in acute traumatic. Um, but they are slightly different because they show, they don't show this compact nature. They are more granular and slightly tight use. Neuromodulin, quite a few neuromodulin. Neuromodulin is the only glycoprotein produced by the kidney. It has important uh, function and they can be seen, they can be seen sometimes within the interstitium. The tubule is damaged and they come out in strongly PAS positive. Um, or you can see calcium oxalate crystal within the lumen and sometimes the tubular epithelial cells are also kept. Or myeloma cast. The myeloma cast are quite distinctive. Um, they are often angulated, they are fractured, broken up, and they excite, uh, they excite a macrophage reaction and inflammation around them. Next, look at the uh, some cut off there, but that's a tubular interstitial inflammation. 
at low magnification here on the left hand side panel, you can see that many of the cells are lobulated. Intermediates are lobulated, they're polymorphs. And interstitium is edematous, almost empty looking, and there is some infiltration of the tubular epithelial cells with, uh, with this polymorphonucleosite. These are, this is a polymorphonucleus cell tubulitis, most likely infectious pyelonephritis. Uh, um, on the right hand side, mononuclear cell tubulitis. Cells are not polymorphs, they're mononuclear. Uh, the interstitial edema. Now, one thing to look, one feature you must look for in order to diagnose that tubulitis, tubular interstitial is that cells are present within the basal lamina of the tubules, of the intact tubules. Tubules which are viable, they contain uh, inflammatory cells. Tubules which are not viable can be overrun by inflammatory cells. That doesn't mean active tubular interstitial nephritis. The tubules have to be not atrophic, it should be op open tubules, functional, viable tubules, which has to have, which have to have this uh, intra cytoplasmic luminal uh, inflammatory cell, call it tubulitis. Very important distinction to make, uh, especially in transplant pathology, because that is a sign of T cell media. Um, when you look at the inflammatory cells closely and you see eosinophils, that's eosinophilic interstitial nephritis could be due to drug for sensitivity or a yeah, feature of chugg strauss syndrome or it can be a feature of just any other hypersensitivity. One of the best stain to look for, to look for eosinophils, there are few in number, is Congo red. Congo red is the best stain. Uh, you're not looking for amyloid depth. Stain is, it stains the eosinophilic granules very clearly. Low magnification you can uh, if there are, or if there are polymorphs that show in your This is a case of infection trust. If you on the outline stain, heavy infiltration, polymorphic leukocyte, lobulated. One, one uh, brief word about the eosinophils doesn't always mean hypersensitivity in nephritis. You can get eosinophils in bacterial infections also. It's important diagnosis, uh, diagnostic feature to keep in mind because um, uh, if you say in your report is definite hypersensitivity, then the patient may be treated with steroids. Um, but of course, the urinary, uh, urine analysis also inform the clinic. hypersensitive reaction. Now, scarring. You can see, have a diffuse interstitial scar. The tubules are separated by interstitial tissue. The mass and stain rather light, so the green type 3 collagen separating the tubules. Tubules are somewhat atypic as well. You can have uric granulomas, uric acid crystals are dissolved and they fix the specimen of alcohol. Nobody does that, so uh, most histopathologists will this, there is usually a reaction. Also keep in mind that uric granulomas are seen usually in deep in the cell. The bias is superficial, cortex only on the superficial uh, medulla, you may not, you may miss granulomas. Or you can get epithelial granulomas. Epithelial granulomas don't always mean infection, don't always mean sarcoid, it can be seen in hepatitis. See them. In fact, in sarcoidosis, you don't get fully formed epithelial granulomas in the kidney. Or you can see interstitial form cell in cases of gross uh, proteinuria. Sometimes in some of the hereditary. So every time that thing appears, read this. Okay. Uh, now, 
you have to give an estimate of IFTA, so initial fibrosis and tibial atrophy score. And this is always assessed in the cortex because in medulla, normally there is a lot of interstitial tissue. And it depends on different depth of medulla, the, the interstitial tissue goes on increasing as you go deep. So you can't really estimate scarring in medulla. You have to have cortex. And here is an example of uh, tubular atrophy, tubular, uh, tubular basin, there's a, there's a lamina of crinkled, drunken, and um, there is a redundant basal lamina. That means that there is this outpouching of thickened basal lamina of tubule um, and glomerulite. Erotic as well. Masson's uh, trichrome stain outlines the interstitial scar tissue uh, very clearly. How do you estimate the amount of interstitial scarring and tubular atrophy? Um, you have to go. So there are methods like image analytic system which are not really practical to do in day-to-day -day practice. You can stain the collagen with serious red and um, set the uh, image analysis system to estimate the amount of red, number of red pixels versus the rest of the volume or area of the, of the cortex. Give you a result, but these are very, very complicated, tedious. Can be used. What I do is I eyeball them at 10 times magnification. So it's a whole biopsy you see 10 times. In each, each field, you estimate how much scarring is there. Then you calculate the average, and it works roughly. At least it is reproducible. So if I see it after a year, I will come to the same conclusion, only the same, same result. Uh, also important to notice the type of scarring. Now here, the scarring is focal. See, that's the focus of scarring here. Island of relatively preserved tissue and then another track of scarring. This usually suggests vascular etiology. Um, this is the so-called striped fibrosis seen in uh, cyclosporin A toxicity where small vessels are affected. So that's striped fibrosis. Usually it means it's vascular etiology. Uh, scar. Uh, most of the time, this is matched. Tubular atrophy matches the uh, degree of uh, interstitial scarring. That usually means the glomerular disease. If the tubular atrophy and, and interstitial scarring is out of proportion, is too much compared to the number of glomerular affected by sclerosis, then it usually means a primary tubular interstitial disease, hyalonephron. Right. Now look at the arteries. Uh, do you estimate number of arteries? Uh, it varies, the practice varies. I usually count them. It is essential to count them in transplant pathology because uh, uh, you have to then, the, the actual vasculitis or vascular inflammation in transplant biopsy is maybe very focal. So if you only have one artery and it is free of inflammation, you can't be sure. It depends on how many arteries you see. Uh, so you must measure, count the number in uh, transplant biopsy. Um, I count them because it focuses you on arterial disease, arterial lesion. I count them in all. And you, you also look at the caliber of the arteries, how many of them are, are small arteries and how many big ones. Because lesions differ. Some of the lesions like uh, the cyclosporin and acrozymous toxicity is limited to arterioles and mainly small arteries. Well, arteriosclerosis is mostly in the medium caliber. Now, in arteries, you look for whether there is inflammation of the wall, not inflammation around the artery, but within the wall. That is a feature of vasculitis. If there is luminal occlusion, it could be due to thrombi or due to fibrous tissue. If there is intimal thickening, again, it could be fibrous or mucoid. You see examples of them. Or if there is medial thickening, or it could be highland medial. Now, this is a medium sized artery here. And how do you how do you express the, the amount of narrowing? And what you do is measure the outer wall of the artery yeah, versus the lumen. So ratio of this upon that. This is the way the radiologists measure the carotid artery stimulus. They measure the whole artery diameter and then the, what's the lumen like. So here, for example, this will be the denominator. 
and the black will be the denominator. So you can say one third is mild, one third is two third, moderate, more than two third is severe. Then look at the specific lesions like highline arterio. Sclerosis. Now we are coming to arterial level. Highland arterial sclerosis, the distinction between the uh, medial fibers is gone. It is by homogeneous eosinophilia. Very specific lesion, especially seen in uh, benign uh, hypertension, essential hypertension, and also in cyclosporin, alcinivel inhibitor toxicities, also seen in it is that both these efferent different arterioles are affected. Hypertension usually afferent arterial affected. So it's highland arterial osteoporosis. Uh, you can see a thrombus, pyramid of thrombus, rhombus, causing complete obstruction. The lumen here, identified by cholesterol clefts. Um, this may be the only lesion uh, causing renal failure, usually associated with uh, aortic severe aortic. In uh, lower aortic thromatous lesion. This is the mucoid intimal thickening. The intima is from here to here. That's the media. The small artery, instead of fibrosis, you are finding this loose edematous tissue. Mucoid intimal thickening is a special feature of diseases like antiphospholipid syndrome. So, important lesion to identify. Or you can see thrombotic microangiopathy. Uh, here you see here. For example, uh, is expansion of the intima, marked expansion, hardly any lumen seen, fibrinoid material, and some broken RBC, yeah? The same broken RBCs are seen in the peripheral digestion as well, and um, lactic dehydrogenase levels are usually high. So important to recognize this lesion as well. Now, arthritis. Now, arthritis is where the art arterial wall itself is inflamed. If inflammation is around the arteries, that's not arthritis. It should be within it. It can be segmental. And if you see, this, this is intact media. Yeah. And nearly a third of it, right, the inflammatory cells in the media. So that is segmental arthritis. This is the classical lesion of polyarthritis nodosa, where a medium sized artery, you hardly see any media left here. And this is circumferential, almost the whole circumference. There should be not. So you have to identify which arteries, what caliber of artery is affected, and whether it's segmental or glow or circumference. Right. Thing is jumping. Right, now it should be here. Don't know what I'm doing wrong. It's going back. <laughs> Sorry about that. So immunohistochemistry, either immunoperoxidase or immunofluorescence. Um, immunoperoxidase has the advantages that you can where exactly the positivity is. You can exactly identify it. It's in the glomerulus, which part of the glomerulus, mesangial, very clearly. You can now see if the cast is present, positivity is in the tubular lumen or not, or tubular cytoplasm, uh, or in the tissue. The, the disadvantage of immunoperoxidase is that uh, it's a tricky stain to do. It takes a long, a very long time to the technicians to get familiar with it, and not all antibodies work on X tissues, paraffin embedded tissues. So that's the disadvantage. Immunofluorescence advantage is that's very quick. Same day diagnosis in a few hours, you know it. Uh, most of the antibodies will work on immunofluorescence samples, fresh samples. Disadvantage is that you don't know exactly sometimes where exactly the positivity lies. It's all dark in the background. So everything is dark. That's a disadvantage. Uh, this is an example of immunoperoxidase staining. It's all brown, the one color. 
And here you see the capillary wall positivity based on membranous DN. So in the mesangial positivity is a classic IgA nephropathy or IgA that is. And it is this one is a mix, both mesangium and, and the capillary wall itself. This is a case of MCGN where both are positive. Um, right. I hope it works. Uh, now you look at whether the positivity, the texture of the positivity, here it is granular. Sometimes confluent, but in other areas you can make out it is granular. Whereas here it is linear, smooth linear surface. Uh, positivity all around, all of the GM. Typical case of uh, anti GBM disease. You need to do something about this. <laughs> it's working now. In immunofluorescence, immunofluorescence, background is dark, so it's very easy to pick up the positivity. Uh, here, you are seeing a granular capillary wall positivity, in case of membranous GN, but sometimes you have a problem. Is there a mesangial positivity here as well? Uh, it probably is a, is a cross cut of the same same lesion here. This positivity is cross cut here. Therefore, you are seeing a blob. Um, in the capillary wall linear positivity, in this case of anti GBM disease, very easy to pick up. Uh, this is a mesangial positivity, so called apple tree positivity. The branches trunk and branches of a tree. This is a mesangial positive. And this is a mixed one, capillary wall as well as mesangial positive. Uh, this was a case of MCGN. Um, we notice here also some tubular basement membrane. So, the next slide is don't just limit yourself at the glomerular line. You also look at the tubular basement membrane, for example, here. Also, uh, look at the cast lumina, and also look at the peritubular capillaries in this case of C4D positivity in a antibody mediated rejection. And yeah, are we seeing over the time? So, the renal biopsy report how should we write the report? First, Morphological description. If you have a well structured report, you should say how many cores are present, what is in the core, describe the four renal compartments. Uh, a text report will have to start with glomeruli, tubules, interstitium, then blood vessels. There should be counts. That means if a lesion is present, how many glomeruli are affected, the proportion of them, how many crescents are present, how many glomeruli are affected, the crescentic, which types of crescents are present, and then to look at the immunostain, description of immunostain, uh, whether it is a mesangial capillary wall mix, intensity of the immunostain as well, from one to three plus. Um, and then the second part of the report is interpretation of it, that is in the form of a conclusion or comment to describe here only significant findings, to describe what are the active lesions, percentage of crescent, how many of necrotizing lesions, and chronic lesions. This is very important to guide the clinician whether to, uh, what sort of management is required. If the, the case, the biopsy shows a lot of active lesion, very little chronic lesion, and probably needs active therapy. Whereas the biopsy shows mostly chronic lesions, then active, so they, for example, active aggressive immunosuppression will not be warranted because it's not going to benefit. This is very important to have uh, estimate or assessment, uh, a brief assessment, active versus chronic lesions. Um, 
Before you write a report, you always should discuss with the clinician because the report is a mutual exercise. You must discuss if there are more results available, whether what you are going to say matches the clinical uh, findings. Now, one of the big uh, advantage or benefits of working in renal biopsy pathology is that you're dealing with clinicians who know renal biopsy, pathology of the biopsy. See, unlike other areas of histopathology, in an MDT, you show, you say this is cancer. And they say, okay, fine. Let's see the images <laughs> in pathology. Whereas the renal, renal medicine, the consultants, nephrologists, they know why. They probably are trained in histopathology as well. So if in an MDT you say this is FSG, they will say, show us on the screen very well. They want to see it. Or vasculitis. They want to see it because they know what the lesion looks like. So that's one of the boons or one of the advantages of working in the renal biopsy pathology is that you have clinicians who know your job. They know what, what to see. Uh, diagnosis, if it is possible, in most cases it's possible, and it should explain clinical features. What I mean by that? The clinical features are nephrotic syndrome, biopsy should not be nephritic, should not show nephritic. If it is nephritic, then you should have good reasons to explain it, or vice versa. You know. um, and you use existing protocols or classifications, and there are some examples, like lupus, nef uh, lupus nephritis, we'll see that classification, IgA, time for transplant, vasculitis has a classification now, and diabetes nephritis. So use them, known classification protocol. Um, if you can't make a diagnosis, you offer a differential diagnosis, or if more information is required, you suggest some more serological tests, or if AM is necessary, Point it out in your report, Ian. And that's the end of it. Thank you very much.